Hey everyone, in this video, I want to talk about how we can maximize the reliability of the services we deploy into Azure. I do lots of videos about particular features and functions. I wanted to try and bring a few concepts together when I'm thinking about, okay, I'm deploying a very important service to Azure and I need to really think about how do I maximize its reliability to different types of things? What is my tolerance to planned, unplanned? Planned could be, well, we know at certain point a VM in Azure will be paused because there's certain host level things that have to happen. Unplanned, it runs on hardware. Hardware fails, things can happen to it. Things can happen, hey, I upgrade the operating system. There's now some incompatibility, I upgrade a runtime. A PaaS service updates a runtime. Things can be introduced, and it's normally when problems happen, when we have changes, that can cause some issue with our service. So what are some of the things we can do to maximize our tolerance, our reliability? Now, a very obvious one we always think about is we don't just have one instance of any kind of resource. We always think about, well, we have multiple instances of our resources. This could be multiple instances of virtual machines. It could be multiple instances of uh, workers, of pods that are running some container. Whatever that is, we always think about, well, we have multiple instances of whatever it is we actually need. So I've got lots of instances of this service that gives me protection from different types of issues. Those issues could be, well, okay, I've got my resource. So that's the Azure underlying resource itself, but that resource has, well, it, there's an operating system probably. There's maybe some runtime, there's my application. And things can get introduced that cause a problem in any of those things. So multiple instances, yes, for scale, but also for my reliability. If something happens to any one of these layers, the underlying resource, the OS, the runtime, the app, well, if this goes down for some reason, there are others that can carry on the work. And the key thing I want to make sure I'm doing here is I need isolation between them. I think about, well, there's different things that they're running. How do I introduce some reduction in the blast radius, because something can happen. A rack can fail, a data center can fail. There could be some regional level problem. So we have these different lines between them. And what really I'm thinking about with this is isolation. I want the ability right here to introduce some kind of isolation between the different instances I deploy of my service. Think eggs in a basket, I want multiple baskets. If I drop a basket, hey, there's a certain number of my eggs have gone. And if I'm thinking about these layers of isolation, the key thing I want to do therefore, if there is some blast radius, so each of these units of isolation, well, there's something can happen. So there's a blast radius that can impact everything in this unit of isolation. So if I'm doing this, if I'm worried about this blast radius, so I have different instances, so they carry on, if something happens here, what I don't want is some reliance on something in a different blast radius. That would defeat our whole point of this. So I don't wanna rely on anything outside of my isolation boundary, because yes, I want to limit what happens if I fail, but likewise, I don't wanna be impacted if something fails in another isolation boundary. So what we think about having is, well, hey, there's multiple components to this. I might think, well, okay, there's, there's multiple instances of these resources even within its particular area, but then also, well, hey, there's some balancer that's local to this. And I would have an instance of that here as well. So every single copy of this service that I'm deploying, in this case, I could think of these as availability zones. That's where it's independent power, calling, networking. Well, they each have their own 
complete set of resources. Hey, maybe there's a, a database. Well, they each have a copy of the database. Now, when I get to relational databases, there's particular things I have to think about, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But fundamentally, what I'm doing here is I can think about within each of my blast radiuses, with each of my isolation boundaries, what am I doing? Well, what I'm creating are stamps, cells, scale units of the solution that will be self-contained within that isolation boundary. So what I'm really laying down here are stamps. I have a stamp one, there's a stamp two, stamp three, and so on and so on. So the whole point is I am self-contained. I can function without needing anything in another one because it will completely defeat the point. If I had to have a reliance on something, let's say in another region, well that, that would be a disaster. So think about it. Imagine let's add another resource. Let's say I have a key vault and it had some secret in it that I had to use that secret to go and connect to some resource. Well, if my service sitting over here had to go and read this secret, if this region is down, I've just broken everything. So this is a huge no. I want no cross dependency. Now, how paranoid, how aggressive I am in this isolation depends on maybe the tolerance of the different components. In some cases, I might not even want to share a key vault between the AZs. Now, a key vault is a regional resource. But remember, there's other things that can happen. What if the key got corrupted? What if the secret got changed incorrectly? Well, now these versions in different AZs are still sharing it, so it would bring down the region. But it would bring down the region, not the other region. But I might absolutely decide, actually, I don't even want to share a key vault. I might have different instances of the key vault from a logical perspective. Although it's still a regional resource, it's a different copy of the key and a different key vault. So if something logically corrupted that secret, it would only corrupt that stamps copy of the secret. So there's different decisions I can make on what controls I have, what is my level of paranoia in a way about what I'm trying to do. Now, realize this, for example, a database one can be really tricky because especially in relational databases, what I'm gonna absolutely have is typically one of them will be the primary, the read-write. The others can be read replicas. Now, I still want a read replica in every zone because what that gives me is well, maybe performance. They are going to have to go cross zone. When they want to do a write, they are going to have to have a connection to this one. And obviously, this read write is replicating out to all of the read replicas. But I still have my own copy so that if something happened to this zone, yes, I'm relying on it in normal circumstances but I can pivot off and promote this to a read-write if I have to, if there is some incident there. And once again, I can pick what is the level of blast radius. I may decide it's the region. So I'm using AZs just to maximize my resiliency to small scale issues. But maybe I deploy to four regions and ultimately architecturally it's too complex to try and handle a complete stamp and independence at the AZ level. It depends on my app. I could get so complicated that it becomes unworkable to maintain. So there's always this balance and it depends on, well, how am I using the system as to what is the right approach? But as much as possible that is practical and maintainable, hey, I want these stamps as isolated as possible so I don't have these reliances. And definitely, definitely, I should not have any cross region dependencies, because that, that breaks the whole point of doing this thing. If I do have this scenario with the key vault, for example, what I would absolutely do is, in this case, this region would have its own key vault, and I would write something. It could be a, an Azure function, so that 
when the, this secret is updated, it goes and triggers and can copy it to the other one. Or I have some manual process because if my protection is from, well, if this gets corrupted, if it gets corrupted and I see a signal that it's been changed and it's changed incorrectly and I just copy it, I've broken everything, I've broken this one as well. So maybe I just decide as part of my change control process, hey, I manually go and update those. So you need to think about all those different things you're trying to protect from as to what is the right approach. But I do not not want a reliance across the region. I don't just protect from physical failures. I have to think about logical things. Someone changes it incorrectly, someone corrupts it, someone maliciously does something, there's some problem that causes a permissions issue and I can't get to it anymore. I think of those things, I get more and more mission critical with what I'm doing. Now, when I think about what are those blast radiuses, obviously, when I'm drawing this, it's an availability zone. So what I'm really thinking about here is these different levels, it's availability zones. Within a subscription, what do we see? We see availability zone one, two, and three. So I could think about, okay, well, this is my availability zone. One, this would be my AZ2 and my AZ3. And then it would rinse repeat over on the other side. And this would all be within a certain region. So we'll just call this region one. And then going over this side, we'd continue that whole architecture to region two, etc. So I would think about having all of those different protections as part of it. So I've got these different isolation boundaries. So AZ protects me from some data center level issue, power calling network. Region protects me from a bigger scale issue, maybe a natural disaster. So we talked about we avoid dependencies cross AZ, cross region. I also think about the different types of resources I'm gonna have. So each region has its own, for example, log analytics workspace. I don't wanna share that, so this would have its own log analytics workspace. It has its own key vault. I would have this as well. Now realize there's also going to be this idea of, well, if these are the solutions and they're all within a certain region, I've got multiple regions being used, uh, there's a certain point I have to bring them together. There has to be some service. So what I will absolutely end up with is, well, there's gonna be some global balancing. I have to have some entry point. And when I think about, okay, well now I'm gonna have global services, my global services they should have their own sort of log analytics workspaces. I separate out the regional things from my global things. And the global things are still gonna exist in a region. Uh, I probably do have a primary region, but I don't want them to share a log analytics workspace with those regional based deployments. I'm gonna separate those things out. But it's not just, as I talked about, the physical things. I can have corruptions of a key, a corruption of a secret, an identity issue. If you think about service principles, managed identities, what is the entry point to everything we have? It's an identity. And we often today will have the idea that different resources, well, they talk to other resources. These resources here go and talk to this backend database. So they have to have a permission there's something in there that facilitates that to happen. Now, let's think about the resources for a second and disks. More and more people like to use a customer managed key. Uh, if it's regulatory required that you need to manage the key, great. It's there as a feature that enables you to manage the key. If you're doing it just for the sake of doing it, I wouldn't, personally. You're adding in something else you have to maintain. If I do a customer managed key, let's say for disks, I have to have a disk encryption set, I have a key in a key vault, and I'm managing that, I'm having to roll that key. 
But think about the levels of isolation again. I don't wanna just have one key. If I'm using availability zones as these stamps, what I should not have is one disk encryption set or multiple disk encryption sets all using the same key. If something happened, now we do things. We do soft delete, we do purge protection. We protect those keys as much as possible, but still, if I'm doing these stamps that are isolated from each other, I should not have, for example, a disk encryption set that all use the same key. At minimum, I'll have a disk encryption set for each of my zones using a different key. So that if something did go awry with one of them, hey, I'm only impacting one of the zones access to the disk. So I don't share any resource as much as I can between them. And of course, if you just let the platform manage key, it's not saying I have to worry about at all. But don't just, hey, I'm gonna use a CMK for everything because I feel like it. It adds complexity to you and things you have to think about. So if I'm using that, don't share a key across the different zones. But the identity becomes an issue as well. So if we think for a second, okay, we have our Azure Active Directory. So we have our centralized identity provider. So we have Azure AD. And one of the things that's a best practice is to use managed identities. By nature of being this resource, if it's a system assigned, there's a one-to-one -one link between an identity and the resource. So in a lot of ways, it's gonna be very hard for me to introduce the same dependency for things in a zonal-based deployment. It's very different if it's a user-assigned managed identity. So a user-assigned managed identity is its own thing. I create these user-assigned managed identity. This is its own life cycle. And then I give it certain roles on resources. And then I grant other resources the ability to get tokens as that identity. This is useful. Imagine I had a farm of 10 servers I don't want to have to give 10 system assigned managed identities the same set of permissions. No, I'll create a user assigned managed identity and grant all of those resources in that farm access to use it. Fantastic. But what I shouldn't do is create this one user assigned managed identity and use it on each of these individual stamps. Because now I have some common resource that they all rely on cross our isolation boundary. What if somehow this got deleted? What if someone messed with its permissions and broke something? No, what I need to be doing is creating a user assigned managed identity for each of the stamps. So hey, you get that one, you get the second one, you get the third one, you get the fourth one, etc., And they can then use it to access their permissions. So if something happened to one of them, it got deleted, it got corrupted. And don't use them for multiple apps. Don't use them for multiple purposes. I should have a user assigned managed identity for each specific set of services that need that common set of resource but I wouldn't use it for another app. It ends up getting too many permissions, so then there's a risk of compromise. There's too many hands on it who think they have control of this resource and might change or say, hey, I don't need that one, let's get that removed, and you end up breaking it. So think of these very much. They should be scoped to a very specific set of resources with a specific role in that component. I never want to use the same user sign uh, access uh, managed identity across regions. I shouldn't really use the same one across zonal based stamps. I definitely shouldn't use it across different services or applications. Keep them very, very specific. And make sure in the Azure AD, you have good metadata on them where possible. So it's very obvious to see, well, how is this being used? What is it being used for? Have good hygiene around that. So that, that's a really important thing to really keep these as healthy as possible so they're not becoming a point of failure. I shouldn't be using them across those boundaries. Really think of these boundaries as solid walls as much as you can. I don't want any reliance on things 
and they shouldn't all rely on the same thing if I can help it. I want to keep them as isolated as I can. So if we change tack a little bit for a second. So we talked about multiple regions. Multiple regions are really the ultimate boundary. They're hundreds of miles apart, ideally, and they give me protection from large scale issues. Fantastic. Now, if I use two regions, if I use two, then what, what really happens? Well, each region has 50% of my capacity. So if one of them goes down, I've lost half my capacity, which is not ideal at all. Now I can have auto scale. So, hey, I've got a drop in my capacity, which means there's gonna be a degradation most likely in the performance of my service as a similar number of requests come in. And as I over provision these at both at 200%, so they can tolerate the other one going down. But that's gonna to be tough. And also consider if there is really a regional level outage, especially if I'm using the paired regions, for example, there'll be a run on the bank type scenario. Everyone will be trying to spin up resources. And if all I have is one other region, and let's say maybe I'm very specific in the zones I need and the SKUs I need, there may be short-term capacity constraints that would limit what I can do. What if I use three regions? So if I now pivoted and I introduced a third region, well now there's only 33% in each one of them. So now if I wanted to over provision, I don't have to over provision by as much because I'm only losing a third if one of them goes down. And if there was a failure, I now have two opportunities, two places I could scale up, more chance I could get the resource. If I had four, and also three is nice from quorum. If I have three or more regions, I can do quorum. Hey, one is down, can we still agree that we're, we're meeting some quorum level and let the service run? If I have four, well now it's only 25% in each one of them. And it's yet again another opportunity, a place I can scale up, I can get capacity, I get so much more flexibility in that. And so don't think about it, as I get into more and more mission critical services, try and move beyond the idea of two regions. The more regions, the better. Now again, I get it. From an architectural perspective, especially if I'm using those relational databases, it can get complex. Ideally, we're using something like a Cosmos DB where I can have different consistency levels. I can write to multiple instances over multiple regions, but that's a fairly big deal. But even if I am using a relational database, there are still patterns I can use where sure, I have read replicas, and read is normally most of the work, and then I establish a connection to the right, uh, and I, I architect around that. But the more regions I can use, the better. And ideally, what we want to be doing here is they're all active. I'm not doing active-passive, because if I'm talking mission-critical, I probably don't want the downtime with a failover. So we think active, active for all of these different services, so they're just running. If there is some blip in one of them, there's gonna be some probing going on to check the health of them, are they responding, and send those signals back and redirect as they need to. So more regions, the better. Again, don't pick regions that are all tightly next to each other. Again, I'm trying to think about distributing protection from all those different types of issues that can occur. Now, as we talked about though, as I start to use multiple regions, this idea of the global balancing becomes a pretty big deal. Because of what I typically don't want is lots of different endpoints. So this is region one's endpoint, region two's endpoint, region three, that doesn't tend to work very well. And so what we'll have is some global entry point for our solutions that the clients will go to, which will then redirect them. Maybe it's to the one closest to them from a performance perspective. There are different algorithms we can use for that distribution of traffic. But if I think about the global balancing options available to me, 
from an Azure perspective, typically it's things like Azure Front Door, which is a layer seven, so HTTP, HTTPS, etc. And then there's things like Azure Traffic Manager. which is DNS based. <laughs> but realize, now, these services are highly reliable, highly resilient. It's not some single box. They are distributed over all of the different regions. They're using any cast for the entry points for these IP addresses. But they still have a finite SLA. Something could still happen to the service. And these are now at the front of everything we're doing. It's getting those requests in, and it, it's balancing over all of the different things I could have. And so when I'm architecting my solution, if I think about what's ultimately happening, is there's some client. I have some client, now that could be a person on a browser, it could be a client app, it could be another service. And that service uses this service that's being offered. Whatever that is, if I can, I wanna build in some resilience to this, the ability to fail over, to have an alternate. So maybe ordinarily, it goes to Azure front door. But if this fails, hey, it can go and look at Traffic Manager instead. Or maybe it uses some third party some other solution out there. Maybe the client, so this is its first choice, then maybe it can fail over to one of these if this it does have downtime, or maybe I can cache. Maybe I can cache, well, what was the last address I was pointed to? So in the case of this doesn't work, can I just go directly? If it was getting a DNS record back, can I cache the last response for some time to live? so that if it's not available, hey, I can just go directly to the last one I used. So do I have that ability to, again, add some resilience? Because, hey, I could have this fantastic solution with four regions, but if all I have is one entry point, I, I am introducing a single point of failure, potentially. They don't have 100% SLA. I don't think any service has 100% SLA. And I would actually caution you on that. Even if a service had 100% SLA, what is an SLA really? It's a financial contract that they'll give you a certain amount of credit back. It doesn't mean they can achieve 100%, they'll just give you some money. If your service is that critical, that may not matter to you that much. The service credit of here is $100 back, who cares? And so think realistically, nothing generally can be 100%. So always think about, what is my backup approach if there is a challenge there? How can I solve that so my service still runs, can still be contacted, can still be used um, to provide the service I need? So don't have some single point of failure anywhere in the architecture. I have to think, what could my, what could my alternate approach be? Be it something on the client, be it some alternate service they could go and connect to. Uh, there's, there's options around that. Don't forget about silly things. I mean, these all live in a subscription. Subscriptions have limits. If I'm approaching those limits, I might need multiple subscriptions. And Virtual Machine Scale Set has a limit. An AKS node pool has a limit on how many it can have. Make sure you consider those limits, and some of them are hard limits, some of them are soft limits, they're just quotas. Make sure you're building those in as part of the overall architecture to make sure you're not gonna introduce some non-real limit just because of how you've designed these stamps. So when we talk about these stamps and scale units, sometimes they may have to distribute over subscriptions just because of the sheer scale of a service you are creating. So a lot of this has been thinking about how can I add resilience from some blast radius issue? And it's important to think that Microsoft are constantly rolling out changes to Azure, constantly. Now they use this safe deployment practice. You, there's lots of articles about this, but this SDP. I don't want changes to hit things at the same time. So the way Microsoft does things is it rolls things out region 
by region, by region. There's some uh, time gap between them. And even within the regions, they roll it out AZ by AZ by AZ. So again, if there was a problem, it's not taking down everything at the same time. This is one of the benefits of using the paired regions because they guarantee the paired regions uh, don't get updated at the same time. So another benefit there is, hey, yep, I'll use the paired regions. Maybe I'll use two different sets of paired regions. I have those AZ deployments, so it's gonna roll out those changes in that manner. And maybe the way I use this is for my own environments, I might think about, well, I have my non-production in an earlier region. And things like Azure Kubernetes Service actually describe the order they roll things out in. So if I was an AKS user, maybe I would put my non-production subscription and those workloads in an earlier region so they get first exposed to the changes that are coming. And then sure, then I've got my prod region, prod region, et cetera, et cetera. So I can ideally get the non-prod to see it first. So it's about exposing my code to what's coming down the line as early as possible so I can make sure, hey, things are, are still good, things are still healthy. But there are things I control. If it's a virtual machine, if it's an AKS cluster which has both the control plane and then the components within the node pools themselves. An app service has runtimes that you can update. Databases have versions that you can update. So often there are things that I control and I have responsibility for upgrading. And often we'll see the idea of, hey, auto upgrade. And it's like, ooh, fantastic. Let's just turn on auto upgrade. Uh, don't. So do not auto upgrade at the same time. What I mean by that is, I shouldn't just go to all of my environments and turn on all upgrade. Oh, that takes care of it, I'm running the latest stuff, fantastic. What if some change to an OS, to a Kubernetes version, to a runtime in app service, is incompatible with my app? It breaks my app. I, I can't have all of the upgrading at the same time. So maybe non-prod, sure, maybe I have some automatic upgrade and I get some notifications when that upgrade comes, but then what I need to be happening here is I have to test. Changes hit, I have to test them. Now when I think about testing, there's a whole different types of testing. There's functional testing, there's smoke testing, there's stress testing, there's tons of different types of testing, but it has to be automated. Think about it logically. Azure is constantly rolling out changes. There's no good me waiting for something that I think is happening and testing. Now sure, if it's a major change like a Kubernetes upgrade, hey, I apply it to my dev, I can then do my testing. Once I'm happy, I can roll that on. But if this is some mission critical workload, ideally what I want, because again, there are other types of changes just to underlying components, I would like this just running continuously. It's continually running automatic synthetic transactions, things going on constantly. So as the changes are rolling through, I'm constantly hitting those. I have those synthetic transactions to detect, oh, hey, something's behaving in a different way. And only once it's passed all of this testing, then I can think about rolling out the changes. But even then, I roll it out gradually. Okay, I roll it to this stamp, then I'll do it to the next stamp, then the next stamp, and so on. That's really a key point to this. Now, Azure Kubernetes Service, as an example, has different um, channels that I can pick. There's like a patch, there's a stable, there's rapid. There's also options for the, the OS, the node components. So I might pick a certain channel for dev test, once I'm happy, then maybe I go and manually roll out the changes to production. And again, I'm really focused here on the more mission critical workloads. If I'm just running some 
time reporting system. My SLA is two nines or three nines. Some of this is excessive. But if I'm running a really critical workload, I need these things. I need to be have those isolations. I need to have that confidence. I'm constantly testing these things. Some of them have maintenance windows. Kubernetes, again, I can set maintenance windows. So that would be really useful when I think about rolling it out. I'd have sliding maintenance windows for my different stamps so they don't all update at the same time. I'll take advantage of those things. Because the reality is most problems are introduced by a change. Um, sure, there might be some long-standing bug and memories leaking, but most of the time something breaks when we change something. That's just the nature of computers. And when we think about these roll, rollouts, it is absolutely critical that what I have going on is the right level of monitoring. I have to monitor everything. I'm monitoring metrics. Is there some change? I'm monitoring logs. Is there something being reported? Ideally, I'm monitoring app signals. So I'm not just thinking about, oh, the Azure resource is this busy, the queue is this depth, the log and the activity or the diagnostics. Things like App Insights can give me signals from within the app. Maybe it's a, a runtime integration, maybe I'm compiling it in. Maybe I can add in signals from points around the world that are pinging the service, doing synthetic transactions to see what the latency is. Maybe I've got telemetry coming from a client side component telling me how that's behaving but I want a health model with the different types of signals and what the values are to determine what is the health of my service so I can constantly see that. And Microsoft has some uh, documentation as part of the well-architected framework that describes some good health models you might wanna look at. So that, that's, that's a key thing to have. But this is part of the DevOps thing as well. You're always monitoring, you're always getting these signals in because yes, I wanna know for the health of my app, but by getting all these signals, it also tells me, well, what are the pieces of the functionality that's being used? Where should I invest functionality? Where do people give up? So all of this isn't just for, hey, is it broken? It helps me know where to invest to actually have a quality service and invest in the right things. Now, another aspect to all of this is permissions. Because again, I can have all of the best resilience in the world from something failing, the best isolation boundaries, but if some user has access to everything and can be silly and delete something, it's all for nothing. So I really wanna think about limit permissions. I have my user, they're the app owner or whatever they are. To non-production, maybe they have some permissions because they need to troubleshoot, they need to debug, whatever that might be. But when I think about production, I really don't want this. I shouldn't have humans touching production. Maybe there is some break glass and we use privilege identity management. They have no standing role, but they can elevate up to a role if required that maybe goes through some approval stages before they have it. I don't want humans just ideally having standing permissions to any production environment. The only thing that will typically have standing permissions is, hey, I've got some DevOps process and it's the DevOps that does the deployment. So sure, they have some permissions because they have to do those things. But that's driving it. Those human beings, I really want to limit that. And when I think about the human beings, use what's available to me. I'm constantly having conditional access. And that conditional access can get signals from things like identity protection that is telling me about the overall risk of the individual sign-in the user in general that can then help in those decisions. Well, can they authenticate? Can they get an authorization token for this service? Uh, build that into the PIM environment. Now, one of the tricky things can be here though, is that I talked about, well, maybe some permissions to non-prod and some to prod. 
My testing environment should mirror production. It's no good having different permissions for non-prod than prod because then my testing may be a little bit invalid because the permission models are different. So what we may end up having ideally is we have a dev environment. Now the dev environment, sure, I can have access to that. But then what we should have is a test environment and then the prod environment. And I want these to mirror. From a permissions perspective, it's no good um, a resource has a higher set of permissions in test than production because am I really testing the right thing? And so I'll absolutely ideally have this scenario. Hey, dev, yes, we have iron permissions because we, we're debugging things, we're testing all these different environments as part of my development process. <clears throat> when it comes to actually validating, is this ready for production? I want these as close as possible. I want to avoid some mass difference in their structure, the architecture, um, and those permissions. I can use Azure policy to lay down governance. I can lock resources. I think as much protection as possible. Again, we limit the humans, we apply good governance and protections to all of these. I reduce interactions, uh, network security groups between different VNets, for example, locking it down as much as possible just to what's required. If these were different VNets, hey, these databases have to replicate, but I'd only open up those ports. I'd only open up, hey, from the, the front door connections coming in. I'll limit things as much as possible. And that's actually a really important point when I think about these solutions because security is hugely important to this. We talked about limiting the human access, but we realized there were, there were bad people out there. And so if I have a solution, for example, that's internet facing, well, I want things like distributed denial of service protection sitting in front of whatever I am doing. So that gives me this first line. It learns what my normal patterns are gives me reporting on it, I can get assistance with it, it can help black hole traffic. That's the first line of defense. If I'm using front door, well, I can put web application firewall at a global level in front of that to protect me from common types of attack. If I'm using app gateway, I can deploy a regional web application firewall in front of all of these. I think layers and layers of protection. If this is a critical service, we can add things like Defender. There's Defender for Key Vault, Defender for Storage, Defender for Database, Defender for pretty much everything you can. There's looking for signs of malicious intent. There's looking for bad configurations that may be exposing me for different things. That's critical for my important services. Make sure I'm not exposing ports to the internet like RDP or SSH. I use Bastion. I use just-in-time access. I lock it down as much as possible. Um, nowadays, a lot of times there are hardening guides for my resources, maybe hardened images. Use those. Limit the number of possible exposures you have in your environment. Make sure you have good operational hygiene. Microsoft notifies of impactful events, things I have to take action. We see these service health alerts. I did a video a couple of weeks ago Make sure you have service health alerts. Make sure they're going to valid people. Maybe they go and um, create an ITSM service ticket that forces someone to go and act on it. But make sure you stay current on everything. Don't let your AKS fall out of support. Don't let your OS fall out of support. Stay current on these things. And I've got a link below. So Microsoft has this mission critical guidance. So I would highly recommend going through that if I am deploying mission critical workloads in Azure. It, it really is good guidance and will help set you up for thinking about the right things as part of this journey. Um, but that, that was it. I mean, really, there, there are fundamental things that we have to think about. We think about, hey, if we're going to have these isolation boundaries, we create stamps, don't have a reliance on something in another isolation boundary. And if I have these stamps, don't have them all having some common reliance on something. Always think there can be physical problems, there can be logical, hey, a corruption of something. So I wanna use different keys, definitely between regions. 
I want to use different user assigned managed identities if I'm leveraging those. I want to limit the permissions any one thing has to something. Always think about not just things that can fail, think about what could maybe be attacked or corrupted what would the impact of that be on my solution? As I roll out changes, I don't roll out everything at the same time. I want my dev test to see it first, then my testing environment, I'm doing the validation, and then I can gradually roll it out to production because maybe I don't find it in dev test. I gradually roll it out to prod, so at least then I can back out. I've not taken out all of my service. I think of good deployment patterns, blue, green, canary, rings, whatever that might be, to have a good way to roll out changes so I can find the problem if it occurs. Um, but that was it. It's just some things to really consider as part of my critical services. I hope that was useful. I hope I didn't scare you. Again, if you're just running some very basic app, some of this is gonna be perceived as overkill. But it depends on the SLA I'm trying to address. You always think about the SLAs of any individual component. And again, that's the money backed. Even beyond that, I might think, well, what do I, how safe can I really be? And depending on the criticality of the service, it depends on what extent I want to go to. But I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.